2008. I'm speaking to David Wickham, longtime resident here of Hector. Thank you so much for consenting to this uh, interview for Posterity, Dave. So let me begin with the uh, first important question is, uh, when were you born? I was born on the first day of March mm -hmm. in the year of 1931. Oh, I can see you hesitate before you want to give that answer there, right? Because it's... I want to say 2001. I see. No. No, but you don't look like you were born in 2001. Not if this is 2008. So you said to me earlier, you were actually born in this house. Yes. Yes. And um, is that because home birth was traditional around here, or there were no doctors, or you came unexpectedly quickly? Do you oh. Know? I, I was right on time, mm -hmm. like an alarm clock, and uh, so I was not unexpected. Uh, home births, probably. Mm -hmm. The nearest hospital was Shepherd Relief, which was uh, Shepherd Niles Crane and Hoist Company in Montour Falls, had a health program and, and a little, it was actually a, a house that became Schuyler Hospital. Huh. It was Shepherd Relief Hospital. <laughs> which was the forerunner of Schuyler Hospital. So you think there really probably wasn't much around? Home birth was probably much more common? Oh, I think so, sure. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and you were born right here. You've, have you lived in Hector all of your life, or have you made jaunts uh, elsewhere during your years? I've, I've made jaunts elsewhere. I made jaunt to, to college for four mm -hmm. years, and then I jaunted on and off and worked for Uncle Sam for two more years mm -hmm. uh, in the military. Okay, where did you go to college? Went to Michigan State University. And you were in the military during what years? Uh, 54, 55. I see. Uh -huh. And that got me off to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for six months and then to Korea for supposedly 16 months, but it was only 14 months. And then between Korea and Japan, some military schools back and forth to Japan two or three times. So it was kind of interesting. Well, there's a question right there, because, you know, they used to say, how are you going to keep them down on the farm um, after they've seen Paris? You know, you were there in Japan and Korea, but you came back to Hector. So we'll, we'll jump around, but tell me, what, what made you come back to Hector when you could, you were out, you could have gone anywhere? Well, and sure, and on the way back uh, from Korea, when we went to Korea, we went on a boat, and we were in no rush to get there, so it was nice mm -hmm. to be on a slow boat to China, so to speak. Literally, yeah, almost, yeah. yeah. And coming back, uh, we wanted to fly back on military air orders, and we just certainly did that, so you couldn't uh, got home properly. But I can remember a, a senior officer on the airplane talking with me and thinking that uh, I really ought to make the military a career, but uh, Dad uh, had put together some agricultural land, uh, right at mm -hmm. home in a little retail business on the corner. And so I had a, I didn't have to go looking for a job when I got home. I, I knew that I was coming home to a, a family business operation. Where you were wanted. So you had a kind of thing to come back to. Sure. Right? Not, not like some kid who grew up. Right, I wasn't forced to come back. You know, right. it was a but, choice I could have made. Uh, right, but a lot of kids grow up and their, their parents are themselves transient in some place. So yeah. they don't have a life yeah. waiting for them. Right? No, people were not yet in the, <laughs> mobile stage like, uh, like now, we yeah. graduated to. Today, nothing is permanent. <laughs> well, with gas prices, we may not be so mobile <laughs> anymore. So, okay, so let's go back to you were born, which I'm sure you don't remember. But what is your first memory uh, of Hector? What, what, when you, what do you remember playing here as a kid? What, take us back. Oh, dear. The, I think I can, I shouldn't remember, and probably, oh, you know, I, will remember some other things as this mm -hmm. goes on that say, ah, yes, now I remember. But I, I think I can remember the first dog that the family had. Oh. And we've always had a dog. Dad and mother always had a dog. Pat and I always had a dog. And she was a big German police dog, you know, and mm -hmm. her name was Betty. And uh, Betty would let no one do harm to the kids, you know. And, and I can remember mother telling a story, and whether I was in the baby carriage or whether mother was in the baby carriage, and the people would walk up and look in if they put their hand in. Betty was standing right at, uh, and, and she'd carefully put their hand in her mouth and move their hand no away. Kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, and, and I, I think I can remember that. I think I can. Mm -hmm. And um, if you get just a little older, 
Can you remember, I mean, where did you go to school? Do you remember your first day of school? Was it here? Don't remember the first day, but uh, Hector had its own schoolhouse, and, mm -hmm. Hector, and, and that was would sit right in the middle of Route 414 now, over south on the corner of Route 414 and County Road 2 to Logan. Mm -hmm. And the front door faced the south, and I'm sure that it would probably line up with the center line on 414. So that today. building is no longer here? That building is gone. Was that one of those round schoolhouses no, you see? No, it, uh, it was one of six, I think, that Hector had a funny little consolidated district. There was the Matthews district on the Matthews Road, and this was the Hector 1 district right here. The next one north uh, was, is Bobby Johnson's shop. Uh, what's her name owns it now, just north of Bob Johnson's. Uh, the Round School House on the corner of Round School House Road and uh, Baldwin. Oh, Marjorie owns it now, yeah. Mar sure, that was, that was the, uh, the Hatch District, I think they called it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Round School House on the corner of Round School House and Ball Diamond and then on up to the next corner north to the Block Schoolhouse, which was up mm. at the top of the... <laughs> top of what? The, the, not the Fossil Road, the... Uh, Doogie Road? Doogie Road, right. Doogie and Two. And then in Valois, uh was the Two Room School, which is mm -hmm. still there at the end of School Street down beside the church. and. Uh, those schools all stayed in operation until Watkins Glen became a centralized district. Uh, which was about when do you think? Which was probably in 50, 55, 50 someplace along mm -hmm. about there. Mm -hmm. Then in between there, uh, all the schools were about a mile. We kids didn't have to walk more than a mile to get to any one of the schools, you know, which was pretty nice, except at some point uh, from the different schools that I just named by 7th uh, and 8th grade went to Valois and in the one room there were uh, grades 1 through 4 and then 5 through 8 and the other and then you got on the big bus and went to, to Watkins Glen and so the little district here had a, a man that had a big 7th passenger 1941 Dodge I can remember and so he transported we kids to Valois <laughs> to, to the uh, seventh and eighth grades mm -hmm. and uh, up until then you'd walked to school all the time sure from before that i i don't ever remember that uh that we were transported uh so you were one of these parents who could say when i was a boy we walked to school through the snow but that yeah. was true in your case yeah. yeah yeah you know it was no big deal it's uh, you know work over you know where bert selmers lives and the schoolhouse was right beside bert's house mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So that was that was a, a nice thing, really. And how many kids were in this school? Was this a one room thing? You one one room thing, with, with, but eighth grade, eight grades, you know. And so uh, it was it was really it was fun in a way. And if uh, you liked anything particular, as, as a first grade or second grade, if you liked uh, stories and reading, why you could hear all the other grades because they went down in front and sat in the recession. Yeah, recitation benches, you know, and had their mm. their class. Uh, if you like geography, why by the time you got to seventh, eighth uh, grades in geography, why you know the whole world because you listen to everybody, everybody else, <laughs> everybody else. How many kids were in this school? Would you? Say? Oh, I would say at one time that, and in, in, it would vary. Um, I would guess twenty to twenty-five. Hmm. So it was, it was small, quite small, smaller sure. than a class today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody got pretty individual attention too, you know. And uh, the, the school superintendent, when we were in first or second grade, was an elderly lady, I think she, Mrs. Spalding was Burdette. I can just remember her, but then a man from Watkins who was, uh, must have been superintendent of the schools in on the county and his name was Irving Goodrich, and, mm -hmm. and Mr. Goodrich would come around once every two or three months and uh, just uh, ask the teacher if there are any problems or anything, and I'm not sure what kind of control the superintendent had over, you know, I don't think there was any such thing. Well, you know, this is a, an almost completely vanished way of life. Yeah. 
Yeah. Totally. I mean, almost. Uh, there's, I'm sure there are some one-room schoolhouses still around, but they, they must be very few and far between. Was that, do you feel, a, a good way to learn? I mean, have you been walking around thinking, gee, I got a lousy education because I didn't go to a centralized school? Or do you feel you learned what you needed to learn? You went to college. Do you feel you... Um, had benefits from that? You were closer to the other kids, gender generation. Oh, you were you were close to you know very close to to your neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when you went to Watkins to high school, that was the first time you met kids of your own age from way in that big village of Burdett. Mm. You never knew anybody in Burdett. Really, in yeah. those days. Um, one of my best high school buddies, uh, Bill Burnett. He he and his wife spent. Uh, last weekend here with me. They live in Albany. He's retired now. But I never knew Bill until I went to Watkins. The school had to go to Watkins to meet the kids from Burdett, you know. Mm. Uh, Valois we knew because we were... Uh, You'd see them every now and then, but that's a totally different way of life. Today, you know, you don't think anything going to Ithaca, going to Elm no. Myra, whatever. No. Uh, you know, it, uh, and, and everything happened socially prior to eighth grade happened in the community, actually. And, and there was no fire company here until 1940, uh, 51. Mm. You know, and that was when I was away at college. Well, uh, if there was a fire, where did the fire truck come from? Well, it came from each household, and the telephone went ding, 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 the local operator who, uh, on the party line, uh, would ring the telephone instead of being rings. It, it, she'd turn the crank slow, I mm -hmm. guess, and go ding, 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 and you could pick up the phone. And there's a hired uh, fire at Smith's house, yeah, mm -hmm. and so everybody uh, with their buckets hurried there. Really? And, you know, there was buckets brigades here yeah. in your lifetime. Yeah, or uh, if you got there in time, why, you know, and I can remember some houses burning, and uh, the houses were cleaned out of all the furnishings and everything. You know, the fire was coming, but it was wasn't going to stop it, so he moved everything out, uh, <laughs> lock, stock, and barrel. Okay, so they went in while it was burning oh, and grabbed yeah, what they could. Yeah, yeah. Just did that. Yeah. They wouldn't do that and today. Uh, but when think. Walt Johnson's house burned, and mm. uh, that's the second house north of the Ball Diamond Road where Bobby lives, mm -hmm. uh, his son, and that burned in, in 1950, I think, 49 or 50, and the uh, fire trucks came from Burdett and Lodi, mm -hmm. and maybe Watkins then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what caused the local people to think, gee, we ought to have a fire truck fire. of our own. And so we got one of our own. Did you actually see a fire in the Bucket Brigade days? Oh, sure. And when we before that, uh, depending upon the transportation and what, why, there was a fire. And uh, then it was a longer, you know, it took longer because you were waiting kind of for the house to burn down and the fire to go out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I can remember going and watching a number of houses burn. Houses burn. Uh, <laughs> Could they ever stop them? Were they ever able to save one? Uh, not very often, no. Because no, they just didn't have the, the pardon the pun, firepower to, to sure. do it. Sure, and, and you know, if it was coming from Lodi or Burdett or Watkins, uh, it took it a while to get here. Uh, Hmm. So, <laughs> uh, you know, probably more houses along this road have burned and been rebuilt than, than I can remember. Hmm. Was, was there ambulance service back then? Mm -hmm. No, the ambulance service was, was the local undertaker who was in Burdett, and his black hearse was multifunction. Uh, it was an ambulance if it needed to, and it was a hearse if it needed to be. <laughs> So Elmer Arnold, the undertaker, and his uh, predecessor, uh, sure, <laughs> Kenny May, mm -hmm. you know, was the undertaker and was the ambulance man. Yeah, you get him coming and going. That's yes, right. You know, what yeah. are you going to do? <laughs> so um, let's let's talk about now. Let's say you're on your walk to school. Well, maybe you're in eighth grade now or something. I mean, you know, this isn't hypnosis, so I can't really put you back there. But you know, if you're if you're walking to school. And what is it you see? Did you see, as you looked around, something different than what you would see today, looking around, Hector? Well, sure, but uh, we only, I never walked only to 
south to the school, so I really, you know, didn't know much about what was going on. Okay, well, in the areas you must have been around the area though a bit. Sure. So when you were going around, what was what was different? I mean, for instance, was there ever a movie theater in Hector? No, no, never, never no, was that size. Never, never. But were there ever more stores than there are now? Sure, I can remember three stores in Hector, mm -hmm. of which. Uh, Two of the buildings are still here. Mm -hmm. uh, the third building is gone, and uh, then one went. Gosh, and that was Slocum's, and I suspect Slocum store, which was right on this side of Sawmill Gully. Mm -hmm. uh, that went when the road was relocated instead of going down through the gully. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, that was torn down, and. Uh, some of the pieces of that store are still around. Dick Adams, Bud Adams's youngest brother, mm -hmm. lives down at the lake now in a what we called a cottage. And the man that tore down Slocum's store, it had a lot of nice oak wood in it. And Dick Adams' front door to his cottage is the front door to the Slocum house, which mm -hmm. was attached to the store. And Dick never knew that, but I told him one day, you know, I know where your door came from, because big oval cut glass, and that was the front door of the Slocum house hmm. and so you know that was in that uh, was a big building uh, with a house attached to it and the telephone operator Mrs. Slocum was the, the local operator and uh, his kids uh, don't know whether we ought to stop going to school but we'd stop coming home from school mm -hmm. and uh, go in and watch her it was fun uh, she was sitting at her switchboard you know with the cords that come up plug out the sure. and, and so a light lights up and something goes ding ding and that means somebody on uh, line A uh, wants to talk with somebody in line B so you know uh, she yeah she'd pull up the plug and plug it in it was just fun watching her uh, <laughs> do that so uh, that was interesting and the road used to go when you get to Sawmill Gully now we just go right across it but the road used to go down through sure. the gully and uh, well as you know we live there so we we see sure. that all the time. That abutment well, is still there. And uh, if you go right over the edge for your house, mm -hmm. you'd run right into the original bridge, which I never saw. But that bridge got washed out in the flood of 1931, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. And then a new bridge was built, which I remember, and that still went down in. But there's a, a old dug road that. Uh, if you start down over your bank, you'll find that old Doug Road. Oh, sure, I know where it goes is. Goes down to the end of the Wilkinson Road. Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> we've been down there I mean, yeah. uh, many times because we've walked our property sure. and we've seen that. Yeah. And uh, we see the old stone pilings yeah. and whatever for the yeah, bridge, but exactly. as you say, there's no bridge yeah. down there. Well, and I, I never remember seeing that bridge. Mm -hmm. I was too young to. Even for that, yeah. For that. Uh, but the next one down went down through the gully, and I have not been underneath the the bridge that's there now, but our swimming hole was right down there now, just east of the road. And uh, that in the summertime, that's where everybody went swimming, a hot summer afternoon. Under the bridge that's there now is where the swimming hole is? Well, went? sure, it's down there, it's right close by there someplace. Yeah. Uh, and uh, something else I thought about, when we used to come home from, walk home from school, uh -huh. we'd, we'd stay along the left-hand side and, and uh, the house that uh, Irv Irving Davis had, which is now uh, Dam Annie's winery right. tasting, that was the Burge house. And so the road came along quite a ways before it started down. And so we'd walk through their front yard, kind of up on the bank, and I can always remember Mrs. Burge. She was that's a nice, friendly, she was a big lady. And I can always remember Mrs. Burge, you know. And uh, along the gully, the uh, they didn't used to have guardrails like we have now, metal guardrails. We had cement posts with cable in between mm -hmm. them. And the, and the state highway department used to paint those posts in the summertime. Maybe not every year, but every other year. They'd paint the posts white, you know, it looked nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had them around here, Brother Bill and my dinner buckets for a long time. We took our lunch to school and my lunch bucket was green and Bill's was blue. But we came along while they were painting, and we took our finger and got white paint, and we put a, <laughs> a D on mine, and Bill put a B on his lunch bucket. So oh, okay. Remember that. Far out. That remem reminds me that during, during winter months, once a week, on Thursday mm -hmm. maybe, we had hot school lunches. Mm -hmm. And 
you signed up and your mother uh, made something that could go to school with you or that she or somebody would deliver at quarter of 12 or something and it could sit on top of the school stove like Spanish rice or uh, mm -hmm. something like that or uh, some kids would come to school with three or four great big cans of beans and the teacher would have to open the can of beans and heat them on the top of the stove. And, uh, that's far, but that was that was all like from the parents would make all Sure, it wasn't yeah. no school chef then, right? No, no, no. Yeah, none of that no, because everybody was... carried their own lunch bucket. And, uh, hmm. Yeah, no, it was a very different time. The three stores did they all were they all general stores or did they have oh. different things? They were all all did different things. Uh, the one that was right here, which grandfather and father owned, uh, was right out close to the road, and that was a gas station, and the the store building was the little thing today that's called the deli. Okay, so just that's that, that just that little part just of it. Just that little part of it, and that was way out by the road about, uh, you know, real close to the road. Uh, because of, now, is it further from the road now because the road moved or because the, you moved, they, you moved the, uh, well, the building? The, the, both. The road got much wider mm -hmm. and the building got moved way back. Right. The Big Stoke building, which is the store now, which was I never remember it as being a church. It was always a hall in Hanley Hall upstairs, and that had been a mm, Baptist church, I think, but long before my day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that that little store was a general store with gasoline mm -hmm. pumps in front. And uh, the next one up was was Mr. Slocum's store, which was. Uh, Almost, if you went out the front door of your house and went right straight across on a level mm -hmm. and nothing was down in, right. and uh, you'd come to uh, Mr. I'm trying to think of the man's name, he died this past year, his mobile home that sits up on the bank mm -hmm. right, right next to uh, uh, Tommy. So, but what did Slocum sell? And Slocum. Uh, besides the house being attached to it, right. uh, he sold uh, general merchandise and groceries. And mm -hmm. when I say general merchandise, that meant uh, gloves and clothing and uh, probably buckets, you know, hardware sure. items of hardware. And the third store, what did that and sell? The third store, he went over and turned left on County Road 1 and went up to the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. And on the left, that's where at that time it was Wright Brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was the eldest of the Wright brothers was Bill Wright. He was also postmaster, and so the post office was up by the railroad track. Mm -hmm. And then there was next eldest was Herbert, and the next eldest was Grant. And those three brothers ran the general store, mm -hmm. which also uh, groceries, general store, but then they had a feed and coal business up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the now, in those days, if you wanted something that wasn't locally available, you certainly didn't get on the internet and look for it. No. So were those the days of the Sears World Book catalog? Is that oh, sure. Did? Everybody you got, you probably had two of them. You probably had the Sears and you had a Montgomery Ward. Mm -hmm. and Se or Sears and Roebuck or Spiegel. Mm -hmm. Spiegel was not nearly as common. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. and, and we kids always thought it was, you know, uh, it was fun to look at catalogs. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a whole world. It, it's a dream, it, yeah. It, uh, uh, and, and Spiegel's always seemed to be uh, a little better product, maybe we thought, you know, mm -hmm. if, if it was Spiegel's it was just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending upon uh, your parents' purchasing ideas, why some people thought that uh, Ward's was better than uh, Sears. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Leave that to the historians. That yes. debate, we will. Yeah, yeah. But there was these were the things, and then so you you had that. And did you ever go? I mean, how often as a boy would you get into Watkins, or how often did people go any place? I mean, was Watkins just the big city back in those days? Or? Well, sure, and, and uh, it was a on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad and mother would take me kids to the movies, to the matinee on Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow, the Glen Theater, you know, right. was was going strong right. and. Uh, uh, back then, I can remember one of the first two movies. I can remember Shirley Temple and the Poor Little Rich Girl. Oh, I love Shirley Temple. Uh, and I don't know what year that was. Was that in the late 30s? Well, it must have been. <laughs> Something can be looked up. Yeah. And uh, 
then the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs probably I think came that was on. 30s too, I think. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, those were, uh, <laughs> I'm groping for some of the other people. I, the uh, Marx Brothers, mm -hmm. They prob that was probably a little bit later. We, as kids, uh, we didn't, we weren't quite up to the Marx Brothers uh, mm -hmm. humor yet. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah. Well, some of us are still catching up to it. Yes, that, yes. Uh, and uh, to go big time shopping, mm -hmm. which is kids, mother took we kids with her when she'd go Christmas shopping mm -hmm. to Elmira. Ooh. And that was a, that was a, a day's treat, you know, because uh, everything was downtown in Elmira. And you'd walk by the big hotel, which was the Mark Twain Hotel, mm -hmm. which you heard all about because uh, back in those days, you listened to one of three different radio stations. You listened to W whatever Elmira was, it wasn't E-L-M, W-E-N-Y, yeah. yeah. with studios in the Mark Twain Hotel in downtown Elmira. Or you listened to WHCU from Ithaca, mm -hmm. uh, and that came from up on the campus at Cornell mm -hmm. University. Or you listened to WHAM, Wham from Rochester, and that was the biggie because that was a fifty thousand watt clear channel sure. station. That's right. <laughs> you know, uh, you know they're old stations if they spell something. If it spells Wham, for instance, yeah. it has to be an old station sure. because. They they took anything that spelled anything. They and took and up still first. today, you know, W O W O Fort Wayne, Indiana. I mm. won't listen to it, but we used to, and, and they were yeah. the big fifty thousand watt stations that you heard usually late at night. You must have had one of those big AM radios and oh, yeah. see what you could get. Sure. And I can remember when FM came on. Wow, oh, yeah. uh, and that was that was wow. That was big time to have an FM radio. Right. Uh, uh, well. Boy, it, it, it's it's a kind of a, I, you know, it always sounds idyllic, but I'm sure that there were other aspects. It couldn't have all been just Courier and Ives, right? There must have been some problems associated with living a rural life like that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm groping to remember some problems that, uh, mm -hmm. that there could have been or were. Uh, well, it's nice if you can't think of any. You know? I can remember we, we had to have bicycles, and Dad bought Bill and I each a used bicycle. Mm -hmm. But we had to have a new bicycle, and we had to work for our bicycles. And well, we, we had a lot of, I've got a lot of lawn I mow today, but uh, Bill and I each had a push lawnmower. And I don't mean it was an engine on that, no, no you pushed it and the blade, would, yeah. the blade went around, and uh, we'd each start mowing. Uh, good season on Saturday morning and we get done just after dinner and we got 25 cents a week for each of us for mowing lawn. This must have been the source of your fortune. Well. With 25 cents a week you were we, we salting were away. Saving for our new bicycles. Oh yeah. And uh, the hardware and then by then the store, our Wickham store was selling some hardware too and, and the, the wholesale hardware business came out of Elmira and it was Barker, Rose, and Kimball, and they had a sporting goods department. Uh, we didn't have any, but uh, they had bicycles set up down there, Dad said, so uh, he took Bill and I to Elmira, and we looked at our Schwinn bicycles with a spring fork in the front, you know, kind of knee action type of thing, and we'd saved our money from 25 cents a week, and we each spent $24 and some odd cents. That's a lot of mowing on the lawn. Yeah, and one was blue and white and one was red and white and had a tank with a, put two batteries in and a button on the side that had a horn in the tank and it had a light on the front fender, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, those were nice bikes, yeah. I know. But you know, I grew up in Manhattan and I don't have a hard time thinking of bad things about Manhattan. I mean, there were some nice things about it too, but I mean, there was crime, there were, you know, people. <laughs> drunk on the street and things like that. It's easy to remember yeah. some of the bad yeah, points. We, we didn't... But you didn't have the same ones, I know, but you really, it's amazing. You just don't really remember the bad aspects no, of life back then. No. Well, that's, that's very blessed, I think. Okay, so you, you graduate high school, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm jumping around a little, I know, and uh, you go off to college. What was your major in college? Well, and I, earlier on, I told you I graduated from Michigan State, yeah. East Lansing, and I did, but I wasn't sure when I got out of high school that I wanted to go to college. 
but that was kind of what most of your peers were doing, you know. And uh, and Cornell had a, a short course, so I went to Cornell, took their two-year course in pomology, fruit growing, mm -hmm. and uh, so all of a sudden I find myself at home, uh, having been to college when I'm 18, mm -hmm. 19, and everybody else, so, well, they, they were still off of college, so I was I was home winter quarter and. Uh, I think I would be smart. And Dad says, "Well, yeah, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea if you got a couple more years of college." Mm -hmm. So uh, he had red blood from Cornell, and Brother Bill had red blood from Cornell. And uh, by then, my brother-in-law he was going to Cornell, and my good buddy uh, Burnett Burnett from Burnett he was going to Cornell. You know. Ah, 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 ah. And I did not sure I wanted to go back there again, so mm -hmm. uh, Dad said, uh, "Well, let's look at some other ones." And so we looked at them, and on paper, never got to see any of them. The mm -hmm. University of Connecticut the stores, mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Polytechnic, maybe they had an agricultural program in Michigan mm -hmm. State. So I picked Michigan State, and uh, sight unseen. Packed my bags on a train, and they run a quarter system instead of semester, and uh, <coughs> arrived out there to begin the winter quarter of 1950. <laughs> Must have been early. 51, yeah. 50, 51, 51, yeah. 52, 53. But sure. after that, you went off to the war. So. Yeah, and so uh, I graduated in '53 from Michigan State, and. Uh, Glad I did because I know a lot of people around the state of Michigan, and uh, at that time there were 500 students from the state of New York going to Michigan State. Hmm. It was a big school. But you got your degree in agriculture. In an agricultural extension, I could come home and be a, a uh, an Irv Davis or mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, those those kind of people. But I, I took that because it's a good broad, you know, everything from dairy to poultry to to business to Horticulture, the, the whole nine yards all rolled mm -hmm. into one. So, and your family had land holdings. I assume it still does around here. Well, in the meantime, sure. And, and this I, this house is on what we call the home farm, which mm -hmm. was uh, eighty acres. And in mm -hmm. nineteen forty-six or seven, like when I was a junior in high mm -hmm. school, Dad bought the farm across the road, which began belonged to Uncle Glenn Mickle, Uncle Glenn's wife was Aunt May, and Aunt May and my grandfather were <laughs> brother and sister. Mm -hmm. She was May Wick and became May Mickle, and so Uncle Glenn uh, was an elderly, and so Dad bought that, and Dad's father, Grandpa Wickham, lived down the road four miles, five miles, and had a farm, and Dad then was working grandfather's farm for him, and so uh, when I graduated and when I got out of the service, why Dad had put together 350 acres of uh, farm mm -hmm. and a lot of grapes. I think about 125 acres of all Concord grapes. Right, and that was all like sold to Welch's, I guess. Yeah, yeah, all went to Welch's. There was a Welch grape juice plant in Watkins, mm -hmm. right where the new hotel is. Right, right. Uh, 30 or 40 acres of peaches, and they were all, most all Albertas, which came right in September. And uh, 20, 40, 50 acres of sour cherries, mm. which were picked by local right. masses of people. And when they no longer could handle that many, why migrant laborers came over from uh, the potatoes to Bend County Potato Land, where migrants picked up potatoes. And but so, these were migrants who ultimately came from where? Uh, probably they came from uh, from Florida. These were not like today Mexicans. They stuff. weren't. No, they weren't Mexicans. They were all. They were all colored people. Oh really? <laughs> yes. And how were they treated when they came up here? Uh, the best of our knowledge, they were treated well, and they were treated well here. We hadn't. Nobody taught us that there was <laughs> that it was not nice to treat colored people un <laughs> unnice. If uh, you know, uh, all you knew about. Uh, Racial relations were things from far away, but uh, didn't uh, didn't affect us out here in the country. My you didn't have any black people living here, though. Not not in here, but uh, in mm -hmm. our high school class, we had uh, two black people, brother and sister, 
and uh, they both happened to be in my senior class, and they couldn't go to Washington with us in 1948 on our senior trip because they couldn't stay in the Willard Hotel in Washington. Hmm. Yeah. You know, who ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> Wow. And so was that a kind of a shocking moment for everybody to realize that? Well, it was one of those things you heard about, but you didn't have to deal with it. Right. Got into in the service down at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and uh, Lawton was a little town right next door, and uh, we would go into Lawton at night, watch a movie or whatever, and then one night there were five of us got on the bus to go back out to the Fort Sill, and boom, 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 and we all hopped in the back of the bus, and the bus driver stopped, and he said, you guys get up front, that back seat is for the colored people, and you're taking their, causing them to have to sit someplace where they're not, they're, <laughs> they thought, you know, hello, hello, <laughs> you know, you had to get out in the big world to, to learn what it was all about. Mm -hmm. and, and out in that country then, too, you stopped at a gas station, and if you want to use the restroom, there was a black one and a white one. Mm-hmm. Well, now, I remember, um, <laughs> you remember the bar down here, Boss Ladies, I don't think it was oh, there sure. for that long. Yeah. But I remember once having a beer in there, and I saw a thing scrawled on the wall, um, which was a common saying in the South, that said, uh, you know, nigger, don't let the sun set on you in Hector, it said. And, uh, you know, but again, this was 20-some-odd years ago, and I always wondered, you know, who, who knows who wrote it? It could have been somebody yeah, who, who yeah. was here passing through from Mississippi, but but you're saying that was not really any kind of thing you no, ever encountered when no, you were growing up. No. People weren't like that here. No, no. You know, it, uh, and, and I don't know whether it's good or bad. It certainly was good growing up like that, but uh, it didn't broaden your uh, outlook on what you might face later on. Right. You know, and uh, when I got in the well, in college, it was a whole different thing. They got in the service because uh, I happened to go ROTC. So when I went in the service, I went as a second lieutenant. And uh, after uh, 12 months, you became a first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Korea, I was a battery commander. I had 150 men under me, mm -hmm. and my uh, sergeant. Uh, yeah, you know, it was a big black guy, most wonderful guy that ever happened, <laughs> Big Ben Caldwell, you know, and wow, you know, I treated him like I would anybody else, and he treated me like anybody else, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, the Army had just been integrated, what, two years before, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, do, do you feel, though, that then, well, you know, this would be an argument people would make, and they would make this about a lot of things. They'll make this about, say, homeschooling, and they'll say, even though the kids aren't out in the world, mm -hmm. there's something in the core of them that's healthier. And would you say that in a way about about growing up here? Do you think there was a healthy core to growing up here in a way that even if you didn't experience those other things, you were sure. prepared for sure. them in some way, better in some way? <laughs> when we went on our senior trip, and we went to Washington, yeah. but we, we made a lot of money as seniors in Washington. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so we had extra money, and we came back and spent one day in New York City. We stayed at the Roosevelt Hotel one night, mm -hmm. and that night, late night after we kids got done, there was a whole bunch of us went over and got on the subway, and we rode clear down as far as the subway would go, and we rode clear back. We just thought that was the greatest thing, <laughs> riding the subway after, you know, one or two o'clock in the morning. They don't do that anymore, do they? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not just for the fun of it. Oh, I don't know. I mean, some people probably do, and there's some people who are just sleeping in it because they have nowhere else to go. So it uh, yeah. depends on, uh, you yeah. know. But I remember when I was growing up, you know, you used to take the take the, um, the Staten Island Ferry for fun and stuff like that, you know, yeah. and all those kinds of things. But, although, of course, if you grow up in a place, you're much more jaded about it. You know, a lot of things... I grew up near Grant's tomb, and I never went there. Or near Sailors, Soldiers and Sailors, some monument there anywhere. I yeah. never went to it once. So I guess it's, I'm sure there were things that you never did here that a tourist they, would do. Sure, but they hadn't invented homeless people, and at least we were, that not, we were aware of. Not in the 50s we, and 60s. That we should be afraid to, to go through a dark alley at night. Uh, well, in New York City, you had reasons to be afraid. But, but we didn't know, we didn't know that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. Yeah. Man. Yes. Yeah, I got I got robbed, you know, I think four times before I was, you know, 18 in New York City. So uh, you know, there were things to watch. But again, it was so harmless back then, you know, 
the, the, the gangs when I was growing up in New York had zip guns. Yeah. You know, now they have nine millimeters with, yeah. you know, clips. So, uh, you know, it's a whole other world. So, okay, so you, you were there in Korea. Did you have a good time in Korea? I mean, I mean, war isn't fun. I don't mean that part. Yeah, the, mean, they stopped shooting, um, <laughs> gosh, mm. nine months before I got there. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and uh, I got there in September and in Thanksgiving time, uh, they were moving our whole 24th Division to Japan. Uh -huh. Didn't need them up in the northeast. I this was Army, this was. Army. This was regular Army? Regular Army, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I got to go to Japan and uh, they split the division all up the Japanese islands all the way from Honshu to Kyushu, Hokkaido all the way up and uh, that was kind of kind of interesting. But at the end of two months the whole division was going to get moved back to Korea over on the south side because the 1st Cavalry, uh, yeah, no, 1st Marine Division was going to come back to the States. And so the 24th Division had to go back and take their place. So I got to go back on the advance party and live with the Marines for a month and take over their equipment and their position, which was right up on the DMZ looking out across at North mm -hmm. Korea. Uh, but still nobody shooting once in a while at night. Uh, our observation post would hear something moving out in the DMZ and everything would go quiet and they'd turn off all the lights, but nothing ever happened, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just enough to make you nervous. I actually ran into a buddy of yours from your wartime years, a guy by the name of Mac. Uh, Thomas? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I don't even know if he's still alive. I yeah, he is. Sure, he was not he, in good shape when I saw He and him. I graduated from Michigan State together in 1953. We went to Fort Sill together. Uh, we went to Korea together. We came home on the same orders together. His, uh, yeah, that's what he said. He said you were always on the same orders. And he was from where? Was he from here? No, he's from Ithaca. Okay, but he was kind of from the area, so at least oh, you yeah. had somebody you could well, reminisce about New York State with. Oh, gosh. And his dad and mother, his dad was uh, W.B. McMillan, his mother was Ruth Rice McMillan. <laughs> and my mother and dad knew both his mother and dad. We never knew this till we... Uh, and I was just looking because right here on the table someplace is a little ticket that's got uh, his son's... Uh, well, don't worry about it. ...stuff right. on it. And uh, I haven't talked to Tom in a week, I guess. And Tom's no. got multiple sclerosis. Yes, I know. I know. It's not very... Bad, 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 bad shape. Yeah. But I go over every once in a while and we go out to dinner. We go down to nice one of the fast food drive-ins and load up with stuff and we'll go up on the hill and his farm yeah. and look out over Ithaca College and Cornell and have dinner together in the front seat of a vehicle. He's a, he's a really good guy. Oh, Tom is a great guy. But, you know, the thing is that even today, in 2008, when I travel around the country as much as I ever do, you know, people just don't even know there is an upstate New York. A lot of people they no, think you're down New York. It's it's the city. So city. when you tell them you're living in this beautiful place in New York, <laughs> they don't know what you're talking about. So it must have been nice to, even if he was from the distant territory of Ithaca, it must have been nice to have somebody there who who knew what New York State was about. Sure. You know. Yeah. I'm sure. And. Um, was it soon after you came back from Korea that you that you met Pat? Or had you known her before? How did you meet Pat? She was from her, Elmira, right? Her, yeah, she lived out in West Elmira on um, 105 Westmont Avenue. No, just, and, but who's counting? Who's remembering? Yeah, but <laughs> out there, back in the distant big city, you know. And, uh, sure, her aunt had uh, been coming down to Peach Orchard Point and had a little house down there. Uh -huh. And her aunt had a, a nursing home in Elmira. Uh, on the corner of Foster and First out in West Elmira. Uh -huh. And so Pat was coming up with her aunt, and I didn't see her the first time or two, but the fellow that was working at the gas station said, hey, there's a nice young lady comes up here from Elmira, and you really ought to meet her. And uh, so I made it a point to go down, and she and her, a couple of her uh, cronies from Elmira uh, had gone down to Gardens and then Delaware, Wilmington Gardens. <laughs> no, this, then, yeah, big uh, chemical company have big gardens down in Wilmington. Anyway, Pat wasn't home, and uh, but I soon found her home, and uh, she agreed to have a date with me, and we went to the Mecklenburg Firemen's. Carnival, which was one of the biggest in the county then, and they 
attracted a lot of people from Ithaca. Mm. Uh, so it was a biggie, and uh, there she met Mon and Stuart Foote, and I don't know whether you remember Stuart Foote or not. Name, um, some means something, but I don't remember who were. Local people, and yeah. Stuart was about 6'2", and Mon was about 5'2", and for a long time she thought Mon was Stuart's little sister instead of his wife. And we always had that. Mon and mm -hmm. his wife were both dead, and so was Pat, you know, but that was one of our laughing things. Uh, and. Uh, how do we get going in this direction? <laughs> well, I don't know. I was just asking you how you had met Pat, and then yeah. uh, how long after you met Pat did, were you two married? Uh, probably took us a year and several months to... To be sure. To yeah. be sure. <laughs> and then uh, so then you married her, and you, and you brought your lovely young bride back to Hector? Yes. Uh, we were married in 59, August of 59. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, in January of 59, Dad went to Albany to work for Governor Rockefeller. He was the Secretary of Agriculture yes. or something? Yes. Yeah. And he was one of Rockefeller's original cabinet people. And so Dad went to Albany in January. Mother moved down in June. In the meantime, that left me all alone in the house here. And uh, But Pat and I had... Uh, no went. wonder you had to get married, right? Well, everybody was uh, gone, you know. Everybody was gone, but we weren't. We had already set our uh, wedding date to be June, <laughs> to be August twenty uh, second. Mm -hmm. We had to do that between back then between cherries and peaches. The cherries were <laughs> done. <laughs> and that was always one of the funny things. Yeah, I never and, heard uh, that before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when did you get married? Between cherries and peaches. You yeah, know? That's sort of sweet. That's really nice, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, and the kind of the interesting part about, you know, of course, back in 1959, 58, 59, uh, your fiancé didn't move in with you before you were married. That wasn't even thought of today. Uh, today she doesn't have to be your fiancé. No, know? it's just, uh, just normal, will, normal. willing to... to uh, yeah, cohabit with you. And that's all <laughs> yeah, it is. yeah, sure. And uh, so mother went to Albany with dad to be with dad uh, in June mm -hmm. and so I got to occupy the house in June and July and we were married in August and Pat moved in with me. Mm -hmm. uh, lived heavily, have, have, yeah sure, happily ever after. Well that's good to hear and did, <laughs> did Pat have an adjustment though? Did Pat ever say things like I can't take another minute in this little well, town I gotta get to a big city? Oh okay going back to when uh, the fellow at the gas station that worked there and yeah. had met her, and, and and she told me afterwards. She told Slim. She says, "I'm not going to marry up some farmer with manure on his boots up <laughs> there or someplace." Well, uh, yeah, she found that the living was much, much better than that. Better <laughs> than she had thought. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, people always have these stereotypes, yeah, yeah. right? So, meanwhile, what was going on with the business? Now, at what point did the Wickham's business? Um, Ray Wickham's empire, but you know the the fuel oil business, the gas station. Where was that? How did that develop? Well, uh, you know, in a sense, like Topsy, although Dad had some ideas when he put the thing together in, yeah. in, in the farms and had about 350 acres, and uh, the corner property, uh, the fuel business was just coming into its own, and all of a sudden, wow! It must have been. <laughs> 55, 55, somebody thought that I ought to be postmaster. The postmaster was retiring, and of course back then, uh, postman, there was an appointed job. Mm. There were, you, you had to take a, a civil service test, but it was still an appointed job, and I was a veteran, so I had a five-point veteran's preference, and I became the postmaster. Well, the mm -hmm. post office was over and up in what was the Wright's store mm -hmm. on the Logan Road, and uh, which was kind of out of the way then because the, that business had ceased to be a coal and feed business and it was purchased by some other people and all that was left up there was the empty building which was Holford's Greenhouse mm -hmm. and the little post office annex and uh, I think I had five boxes rented. <laughs> People came up to get their mail. Other than that, you didn't see a soul. And uh, uh, the headquarters of the post office then was in out of Buffalo, and it took a 
an act of Congress could get a post office moved. No kidding. Uh, no. Not act of Congress, but uh, but something big. Sure. So then you. So that's how it got moved into the plaza. There. Well, sure, and it got moved right into the store physically. Right. Uh, and uh, then it began to grow a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, people came to the post office would get their mail, and I it was fun being around. So uh, I went from being a farmer uh, to being a businessman running the store and the post office and brother Bill became a farmer mm -hmm. and so we did kind of a uh, flop and flop and the, the oil business kept growing and that was being run out of the gas station out in the front mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I'm trying to think how the thing went along but uh, built a new building the, the the office building, the truck building, the one next door, mm -hmm. and moved the fuel business out of the gas station and moved the gas station physically back beside the store and put the deli on. That all happened uh, in the early 70s mm -hmm. and uh, made the little plaza out of it, quote, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, by then, the, you know, the, the whole corner was uh, going good and then. Uh, not sure of the timelines on the thing, but Brother Bill's oldest daughter, Judy, and his son thought, wow, and, and there was just the beginning to talk of wineries, of wineries coming along. There were no wineries here then? Uh, Bill Wagner's, Wagner's mm -hmm. was a cellar. <laughs> it was a wine cellar. He hadn't built anything on the top, but... And when, what year was this about? Oh, uh, well, we're in the... Now we're up to the late 70s. So there was not a single winery before the late 70s here? Yeah. Wow. No, and then New York State passed a, a farm winery bill that made it legal for the farmers to make wine and sell it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Wagner's, not sure how, what order they came along, but uh, Bill's two sons, Bill's son and daughter, thought, wow, let's get in the winery business. Well, uh, <laughs> Wait, which Bill are we talking about? Your brother Bill? Brother Bill, yeah. his, his son Will. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Will kind of ran the thing, and uh, I was a stockholder, brother Bill was a stockholder, Will was a stockholder, and Judy, there were four of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pledged certain assets that I had, and, uh, that was, and uh, Will had bigger ideas and so uh, Farmers Home Administration, FHA, loaned Will big bucks for the winery because it was going to go, you know, going to go and uh, way over spent and undercapitalized, uh, you know, spent more than a million bucks on the thing and this was all. And as I understand it, this was the, turned out to be the worst possible time with high interest rates and yeah, yeah, just yeah, bad, yeah. bad moment to do yeah, it, I guess. Yeah, well, at least spend that much money. Yeah on the thing, but uh, looking along the road, Chateau Lafayette, uh, you know, that was a farmer's dairy barn, and mm -hmm. Tom bought that and uh, worked and worked, and uh, Bill Wagner built and built and built and built, and, you know, the Jenny Lee came along as just a flat platform That's right. with a tent on the top of it, and mm -hmm. it got a permanent kitchen, now it's a full-blown, you know, the whole, the whole thing, and uh, so uh, pretty soon, and at, Beautiful building, beautiful facilities, all the new stainless steel equipment, big grand opening, la da 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 da. And uh, at some point, why uh, Farmers Home Administration said, stepped up and said, you know, deed, give us the deed or foreclosure, da 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 da. And uh, so they got the deed, and they got the deed to the whole thing. Uh, my son was been working for me though at that point, and I'd had a, a, a uh, you know, what kind of a small business loan, which all paid off nicely, and so Tim went to uh, local bank and borrowed sufficient money to buy the whole corner out of the thing, and managed to pay it all off in five years. No, <laughs> you know, it was going great, mm -hmm. and our next door neighbor bought all of the land. Mr. Mm -hmm. Delrymple, 
Mm -hmm. We got in the was a great guy, and he bought the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, the home farm, the Mickle farm, which all enjoyed to his, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. was just uh, in the one down the road. And uh, that, and the only thing that I hadn't pledged the whole thing to the winery was my house and the square, everything else. So you lost the 300 and some odd acres last time? Yeah, yeah. walked from everything. Yeah. There's the whole nine yards. But, uh, that must have been very painful for you. Well, it wasn't much fun, but okay. uh, I had my house, uh -huh. and my son then was able to buy the business, and so I went to work for Tim, <laughs> you know, and uh, that worked well because we both had been working together, you know, and uh -huh. Bill's middle son, Fred, stepped up to the plate and bought the home farm, which has mm -hmm. kept it all intact. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that gave his father, brother Bill, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, things to do, and so it kind of all came back together quite nicely, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, two or three years, I bought the rest of my little property, which included the house next door, and it goes mm -hmm. over to the Hazlet line and out to the barn. So I've got about an acre and a half here, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is <laughs> plenty good, and I had a business and then in the meantime uh, right in about the middle of that it was coming up on 20 years of my post office so I took retirement mm -hmm. from that and uh, kept my nose to the grindstone and uh, here we are. <laughs> when, when did you leave the post office? Because it was before we came I didn't know you as well, postmaster. It was about, wow, I'd have to go look at my... my uh, when we arrived the postmaster was Diana. Sure, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then came Sue. It, it started. It started about fifty-five, fifty-six. So you were done by about seventy-six. Then. Mm -hmm. So that was ten years. It might have been before we got here. Might have seventy-seven to seven. Or yeah, that area. Yeah. So that was at least a mm -hmm. decade before yeah. we got here. So that's that's why we didn't see you at the post office. Sure. And, uh, and that was that was kind of fun too, mm -hmm. uh, because I spent a lot of time there, and the post office was, uh, you know, where it was before mm -hmm. the new one. Sure. And that that was kind of like Grand Central, and it was kind of like the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Sure. And, and uh, I knew well enough about the area. Today, <laughs> you go to see the local postmaster and find out something, and and uh, you can't find out anything because he doesn't know anything. Right. You know, but you have to be friendly. You couldn't last two minutes as a rural <coughs> postmaster if you weren't friendly with people. Nobody, you know. Yeah. They've all been friendly. They're all very nice. Sure. People. You know, you have to be. But uh, you know, and I knew every cottage along the lake from Valais sure. to, to okay. Watkins, and uh, I can remember one time, and, and it had something to do with the fire company, and I wanted to see somebody up at Odessa, and we used to have uh, county post office mm -hmm. postmaster meetings. Skyler and Shimon had we had meetings together, and so you knew all of the, you know I knew uh, all the other postmasters, good friends, and I wanted something from Odessa, and, and I was up there and I didn't know where the person lived, and I stopped and Minor Leonard was the postmaster. I said, Minor, where so and so live? He says, Postmaster, you know better than coming here and asking me where somebody lives. Hmm. <laughs> and uh, I learned the. The, the hard way, and uh, somebody comes into the post office and asks you that, and in mm -hmm. just a minute you just step out in the front door, out, on, out the front door of the thing, and then you can tell them all right, but you're not supposed to tell somebody over the counter where somebody else lives, even if you know them. Mm -hmm. um, sure, I understand. <laughs> well, you know, there are, there are reasons for such concerns, even if in a community like yeah. ours, which doesn't, things don't really happen like that. Did you ever meet Nelson Rockefeller, by the way? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. What can you tell people looking at this about the, your memories of the Rockefeller well, administration? Dad thought the world of him, mm -hmm. and, and Dad and Mother knew he and his wife Happy very well, mm -hmm. and uh, I could go in and dig out numerous pictures, mm -hmm. and Nelson used to come to town every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I've got pictures of Nelson um, up on top of one of the first grape harvesters <laughs> oh. here. And, uh, Hank Bond, who worked for Bill on the farm, mm -hmm. and Hank's driving the harvester, and there's Nelson right up beside him, you know, and, uh, you know, good, good experiences, and uh, if ever he was traveling in the area, and if Dad and Mother happened to be home, why, he'd go down to the lake and 
take a nap upstairs in your bedroom one time, but he where he was going, <laughs> you know, which uh, was uh, kind of interesting and uh, uh, was one of those household names. And uh, mm -hmm. but he was somebody who your dad you knew him on a, a friendly basis. Oh it wasn't yes, just yes, yes, yes. Sure. And, and he attended father when father retired. They had a horrendous big retirement party for dad mm -hmm. in in Albany, and, and Nelson was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember who was the master of ceremonies at that thing, but uh, Dave Hostetter. Was David here? David Madge, at the minister at the church? I, I don't, I, wouldn't, I didn't know that. Uh, and so David went down to Albany to Dad's retirement to do the invocation. I can't remember who the master of ceremonies was, but David was introduced as the rector from Hector, hmm. <laughs> which. Uh, happened in, in a sense because of Rockefeller and that was uh, the ending of uh, Well, we're almost out of time, Dave, so is there anything you'd like to tell somebody to sum up about life in Hector, your life? Anything that you'd like to, to, to say? Well, I'm not sure that I've told anything that other people don't know. One of the things we didn't, you know, the during my lifetime, the, the Lehigh Valley Railroad was here when I oh, got sure. here. sure, that's right. Uh, but that went by, you know, and it's, uh, Still today, ask where somebody lives when it's on the Ball Diamond Road up just above the railroad track. Right. And they, you know, they're totally, totally lost. Totally gone. No, uh, yeah. They don't know what you mean <laughs> when they tell them about a railroad track. And uh, uh, yet, uh, I can tell where all the crossings are because the road, instead of going uphill, levels off just wide enough to be. Uh, Two tracks going by. Well, we've just got seconds, Dave. So if somebody is watching this a hundred years from now, not even somebody who knows you, would you say, would you want them to think, was it a good life living in Hector? Oh, it was a marvelous life. It was just, uh, you know, it's got to be one of the, the best places in uh, New York State. Mm -hmm. One of the best places in the world, you know. Uh, it's uh, it hasn't got all messed up too badly yet. <laughs> when I say messed up, uh, but I think we all know what that means. Yes. You know? uh, but do you ever get tired? I mean, I always I remember talking to Bud. He always liked looking at the lake and oh, everything. Sure. You know, our prevailing winds are from the west. Yes. So the weather comes from the west, whether it's snow or rain or what. You see it come over the hill, goes down, comes across mm -hmm. the lake, and in five minutes, if it's you see it coming down over there, be ready because in five minutes it's going to rain like hell or it's going to be a blizzard, and so you've got five minutes to get ready for it. Uh, <laughs> when we were kids, we used to fish. We don't fish anymore because the fishing isn't like it used to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there were good times and bad times, but uh, yeah. Good. Well, that's a good note to end on because we are actually out of tape, so I will thank you very much, and people 100 years from now will, will I hope, enjoy this. And